Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay, I have to put on my New York voice, they said. So, it is a pleasure to be here in Connecticut. Connecticut. I am in Connecticut, right? Yeah. All right, yes. So, Kip and uh, company have been running me all around, and uh, they tell me every once in a while where I am, but I never know whether they're really, uh, I'm, I'm really there or whether they're playing some kind of trick on me. So yes, it is good to be here in Connecticut. And uh, I think over the many years that I've been on speaker's tour for 37, 38 years or something like that, I think I've only been in Connecticut to speak a couple of times. And uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we have a very important message, I think, tonight, and it's one that we have been making for many years, as you'll see as we go on. Uh, we produced a video documentary, which I filmed 31 years ago, uh, Out of Control, The Immigration Invasion, and uh, I lived in California at that time, and I had traveled all along the southern border. I'm one of the few journalists that have done that. Uh, many times with my own cameras, other times with camera crews, over a period of four years. And back, this was back in the late 1970s and early 1980s to mid-1980s. And traveled all along our southern border and interviewed Customs, Border Patrol, uh, sheriffs, uh, police chiefs, and residents, American citizens who lived along the border, as well as in that video, which you can still see on online. Uh, in one of my other presentations, I actually had a clip of it in here. I don't have it tonight uh, with me. But in many cases, I interviewed illegal aliens and the coyotes who were bringing them across the border. And they were not only from Mexico and Latin America. On a couple of the nights uh, we were out there, they caught dozens of Chinese coming from communist China that were coming across the border. And again, this is decades ago. And so the crisis on our border has been developing for a long time. I went on a nationwide tour with that documentary, and we were interviewed on radio and television programs back then, and we were explaining that if we did not do something about our border, we would be facing a crisis that would be threatening our existence as a nation. Well, that has happened. It's been within our lifetime. It took a while, and most people did not see it coming because it was not apparent. And you might not have it apparent in your own communities today, but it is very evident now that our border is in crisis and there are people calling for an end to borders. No borders, no nation. In fact, on this slide right here, which is taken from the Democratic Socialists of America, no borders, no walls, sanctuary for all. No ban, no wall, no borders at all. Uh, we see variations on that all across the country. Uh, this is a, one of many demonstrations all across the country. No borders, no nation. Stop deportation. This is, uh, it's a worldwide phenomenon. This is a, a uh, internet uh, image I took off of a, a uh, YouTube video uh, for the organization No Borders, No Nations. This is a huge rock concert that they <coughs> held in Bern, Switzerland. Uh, last uh, July and uh, they're pushing this all over Europe as well and we know what has been happening there over the last several years. We've been exposing this in the New American uh, and of course one of the leaders of this movement is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and uh, we're going to be talking about her tonight but in all fairness I have to begin by pointing out that, as is frequently the case in uh, events like this, we have both good news and bad news. And first I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is that we, at the New American, owe an apology to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. 
yes, we admit it when we make a mistake. Uh, but as you know, this is an issue of the magazine where we took AOC to task for her Green New Deal because it was going to cost only about $100 trillion and bankrupt the entire country and if we were to adopt it, destroy our energy grid and our, our economy, or so we thought. However, we did not anticipate that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the socialist millennial bartender Wonder Woman, <laughs> would come up with a miracle. You see, AOC has done the, imp the impossible. She has invented a whole new element that makes her Green New Deal, her $100 trillion deal, not only possible, but affordable and efficient. Now, in order to understand this, we have to revisit one of your favorite topics from high school and college. All of you, of course, have memorized the periodic table of the elements, correct? Okay, so we all memorize that. We all know the atomic weights, the atomic numbers, all of those things, atomic mass. Uh, we remember, for instance, that hydrogen is H, oxygen is O, carbon is C, and we know carbon is a terrible, terrible element. It combines with oxygen to form that terrible gas, the gas of life, CO2, without which our life on this planet would not be possible. But now science tells us, allegedly, that carbon dioxide is causing global warming. Well, we know that um, Ocasio-Cortez has uh, uh, moved things along here. We know that silver, hmm, silver is AG. How did that come about? Why? Well, silver used to be, go by AG, which is Argentum, the Latin name for it. But uh, before Ocasio-Cortez came along, Hollywood changed it to silver, <laughs> SI. Couldn't, couldn't have the Lone Ranger saying Hio or Gentum, so he said Hio or Silver. <laughs> and so we couldn't change Silver to S because that's already taken by Sulfur. We couldn't change it to SI because that's silicone. So we went with Argentum. But Arcasio Cortez has come up with something even better. She came up with Governmentium. <laughs> <clears throat> Governmentium has a symbol, GV. It has one neutron, 25 assistant neutrons, 88 deputy neutrons, and 198 assistant deputy neutrons. <clears throat> giving it an atomic mass of 312. These 312 particles are held together by thousands of morons, <laughs> which are surrounded by vast quantities of lepton-like particles called peons. Since governmentium has no electrons, it is inert. However, it can be detected because it impedes every reaction with which it comes into contact. A tiny amount of governmentium can cause a reaction that would normally take less than a second to take from four days to four years. <laughs> Governmentium has a normal half-life of two to six years. It does not decay, but instead undergoes a reorganization in which a portion of the assistant neutrons and deputy neutrons exchange places. In fact, Governmentium's mass will actually increase over time, since each reorganization will cause more morons to become neutrons, <laughs> forming isodopes. <laughs> the characteristic of moron promotion leads some scientists to believe that governmentium is formed whenever morons reach a critical concentration called a critical morass. <laughs> now, when governmentium is catalyzed with money, it becomes administratium. <laughs> symbol AD. 
an element that radiates just as much energy as governmentium, since it has half as many peons, but twice as many morons. <laughs> so, our apologies to AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Now we know with governmentium and administratium, the Green New Deal and all of her other proposals will not only work, but work wonderfully. And of course she, AOC, is not only pushing the Green New Deal, she is the darling of the media and of the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA, that are promoting the no borders, no walls, sanctuary for all, no ban, no wall, no borders at all. Now that, those uh, slogans are taken directly from the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America website. No borders, no nation. Stop deportation. Uh, here we have a photograph that was carried in much of the media. This particular one was the Texas Observer uh, showing a bunch of people demonstrating here abolish ICE, uh, the Immigration Customs Enforcement. Uh, and we see the same photo. It actually originated from the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America of New York. That's Ocasio-Cortez there on the left. This is her web page for DSA New York. And what do they say in the top up here? Abolish profit, abolish prisons, abolish cash bail, abolish borders, abolish ICE. And the photo that we see here is the same one that was carried in all of the media. So we see the establishment fake news media becoming uh, simply a uh, propaganda forum to uh, help uh, promote all of the socialist propaganda of the DSA. Abolish borders. Again, we see the, the same slogans being promoted all across the country and, and around the world. These are some of the t-shirts uh, that are being promoted uh, by uh, the same thing that you see young people wearing. No nations, no borders, no gods, no masters. No borders, no nations, no god, no masters. Uh, uh, these are just uh, a few of the uh, similar uh, slogans. Again, this is another view of the big festival, No Borders, No Nations, that was held in Bern, Switzerland just a year ago, Ju uh, July of last year. Uh, and a number of others that have taken place around the world as well, promoting this same idea. Uh, here we have the, uh, a bunch of demonstrators outside of the um, United States Supreme Court. It's the Rise and Resist organization, which is part of the Revolutionary Communist Party, which is a Maoist organization, meaning they openly advocate uh, and champion Mao Zedong, the greatest mass murder in history, the, the communist dictator, uh, former dictator of communist China. Uh, so it used to be, just a few short years ago, that the only people really seriously advocating no borders, no nations, getting rid of our borders, were members of the Communist Party, USA, the Revolutionary Communist Party, the Communist Party Marxist-Leninist, the Socialist Workers Trotskyite Party, or other similar far, far left uh, organizations associated with or affiliated with actual communist terrorist organizations. Now we see this being adopted by members of the Democratic Party, not just members like Ocasio-Cortez, but the co-chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Keith Ellison, says that Ocasio-Cortez represents the future of the Democratic Party. This is the leader of the Democratic Party saying, now this, uh, for what was formerly just a communist position, is the official position of the Democratic Party. No one is illegal. In other words, they're trying to make it appear if you oppose illegal 
migration across our border that you are somehow declaring that people are illegal. Obviously, we're not saying that people are illegal. Their actions are illegal if they're violating the law. No border, no nation, just people. Here's the statement. This is from the Communist Party USA's own website here. Statement of the Communist Party USA. Stop raids on workers. They're saying here, no human being is illegal. Now we have all of the Democratic Party, all these young people out there protesting, parroting the Communist Party here, indicating that if one opposes open violation of our borders, you're declaring that people are illegal. Here we have another one from the Communist Party USA, putting people and nature before profits. Proposed re resolution, stop deportation, fight for immigrant rights. We're going to get into this a little bit further on. The very important subversion of terminology of our, of our language that's taking place here. They're not talking about fighting for immigrant rights. They're talking about fighting for migrant rights, meaning those people who just migrate across the borders, not those who immigrate legally. Pueblos sin fronteras, people without borders. This is an organization which has become, just in the last year, two years, uh, a big news item because they are the ones behind these so-called caravans that are bringing thousands, tens of thousands, and as you'll see, uh, according to the Harris and Gallup polls, as many as five million people in Latin America say they intend to come to the United States this year. Uh, and Pueblo Sin Fronteras is the one of the main groups that is organizing this. <clears throat> if they are successful, these are some of the, just a few of the photos that were taken uh, of some of their, their uh, caravans recently. Uh, we will see these expand uh, hugely in the, in the coming weeks and months. They are providing, this is a very important point of everything that we're going to talk about tonight. Most of what we see happening on the border with all of the huge caravans and groups of people coming across are pressure from below. We see these people coming, they're trying to get into the country. But what we don't usually see is the pressure from above. Who is providing the pressure from above in terms of both legislation, in terms of media promotion, and even more importantly in terms of funding the organizations that are promoting this uh, throughout all of Latin America to, to bring the people here. Now, one of the, uh, this is from Rolling Stone magazine recently. It, this is an image of showing some of the pressure from above. Here we have uh, California Senator Kamala Harris, Andrea Ocasio-Cortez, Nancy Pelosi, Ilhan Omar. Uh, these, this is the face, of course, of some of the most radical women in Congress. They are all promoting the no borders, the no nation, uh, stop deportation, abolish ICE, pushing for radical transformation of the United States. They provide some of the pressure from above, but there is pressure far above them that has helped put them in office, finance them, and is promoting them uh, in the media and providing uh, other uh, pressure uh, to help them with their agenda. We're going to go into that. Uh, one of the people that uh, we will come back to that provides this pressure from above that most Americans are, are unaware of uh, is uh, Strobe Talbot. Uh, we will see him. He's a radical Democrat. He was a, a friend of Bill Clinton's. We're going to go into his background a little bit. Uh, president of the Brookings Institution. And he wrote a very important essay which is now being used in all the colleges. It's been used for, uh, for a couple of decades. Uh, the Birth of the Global Nation. And he is pointing out the same thing that the communists at the bottom are. We've got to get rid of nationhood, get rid of borders. He said in this Time Magazine essay 
for which he won a huge award from the World Federalist Association, he said, nationhood as we know it will be obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority. Now he was, Strobe Talbot is a radical Democrat, a friend of Bill Clinton's. He went to college with Bill Clinton. He went to Russia then and was Time Magazine's correspondent there before he came and became head of the uh, Brookings Institution. But here is a Republican, <clears throat> he passed away a couple of years ago, Robert Bartley, editor of the Wall Street Journal. He is a big guy on Wall Street. And he repeatedly, for, well, for 30 years he was the editor at the Wall Street Journal, he repeatedly uh, attacked the existence of the nation state. And he said, the nation state is finished. There shall be open borders. In fact, he proposed that we have a, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution that would say, quote, there shall be open borders. So here we have a paragon of the Wall Street set saying the same thing that the communists are saying. So we have globalists promoting the same agenda as the communist socialists uh, at the bottom, providing pressure from below. Then we have individuals uh, like this. Uh, you see him on the news quite a bit. This is Richard Haas, H-A-A-S-S. -S. He is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. He says state sovereignty must be altered in a globalized era. We see him in this particular photo uh, at the World Economic Forum. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, which he heads, is the premier globalist organization that has been promoting world government and the destruction of national sovereignty and national borders and nationhood for the last hundred years. In 19, and 2021, it will be a full century that the Council on Foreign Relations has been promoting this. So, uh, and, and as you'll see, they have achieved a great deal of power, not only in our government, but in our media and in our universities. And that is why we see this globalism and this anti-Americanism and this uh, whole movement toward getting rid of our borders and our sovereignty uh, moving along in all these areas. Now this has been uh, exposed very thoroughly. Those of you who have been to these presentations before or who are familiar with the John Birch Society uh, may be familiar with this book, The Shadows of Power, The Council on Foreign Relations and the American Decline by James Perloff. Uh, it's been out for now nearly 30 years. This is a classic expose of the whole globalist movement and of the Council on Foreign Relations and how they gained control over so much of our political, economic, media, academic, think tank uh, environments over the past decades. Uh, and why today it seems that regardless of whether we have a Republican or Democrat in control of uh, the Congress or in control of the White House, we've still moved in the globalist direction. So uh, when we get to the whole issue of, of our borders and our security, uh, it, we come face to face with the uh, United Nations. Right here we see the United Nations Compact for Migration. How many have heard of the United Nations Compact on Migration? Anybody? A few have. If you read The New American, you would have. Uh, a year ago, there was even some news coverage of it, even though there should have been a great deal more coverage of it. The United Nations held a summit on migration to culminate several years of promotion of, of this compact. Uh, President, uh, o uh, President Obama had been very instrumental, as had been uh, Hillary Clinton and John Kerry, <coughs> Secretaries of State, in promoting this, 
at the United Nations. It's the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. It was culminated and signed in July of last year. Thankfully, President Trump refused to go, refused to sign it, refused to have the United States become a party to it. That was a good thing. We, we can be very thankful that the United States not only uh, refused to sign it, but didn't send delegates to it. And as a result of that, about a dozen other nations also had enough courage to say, well, if the United States can uh, go against this, so can we. And why, why were, we, were we and these other nations opposed to it? Because the United Nations was going to try to do to the whole world what the European Union had done to Europe in 2015, 2016, basically forcing them to take a couple million illegal aliens. They want to push tens of millions of migrants from all over the world into the United States and other uh, nations. The man who was in charge of that operation was Antonio Gutierrez. Now, who is he? At that time, he was the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. He is the one most directly responsible for pushing the tsunami of migrants into Europe, which has resulted in all of the devastation that we see in, in Europe over the last couple of years. So, what was his reward for doing that? Who is, what is he today? Anybody know? They promoted him to be Secretary General of the whole United Nations. So that is the guy who is in charge of the United Nations now, the one who is in charge of the refugee uh, debacle. And for the last several decades, the John Birch Society and through our uh, magazine, New American, We've been went through our speakers programs and on television radio uh, uh, proposal, uh, programs. We have been exposing the fact that the Council on Foreign Relations and other globalist organizations are actually promoting world government that would subsume the United States, basically do away with, abolish our national sovereignty. For decades, whenever we mention that, people would in the media, in academia, will roll their eyes and say, oh, that's ridiculous, that's wild conspiracy theory. Nobody believes in world government. Nobody's proposing world government. And if you want proof of that, just uh, uh, look on some of our, our videos. For decades, that's what they've been saying. However, uh, just uh, a couple of months ago, in February, we had the uh, World Government Summit. That's what it's called. That's from their own website. Uh, in the United Arab Emirates, sponsored by the United Nations, by uh, groups like the World Economic Forum. Uh, you didn't read about it or hear about it on any of the news media. Uh, if you went to the New American, we reported on it. We gave links right there to show that you could go right to the World Government Summit and watch the videos there. They had Harrison Ford and other Hollywood celebrities promoting it. CNN was one of the sponsors. The New York Times, other major media were sponsors of the event, but they didn't write about it or report about it uh, in their media. Why? Because they don't want you to know about it till they have everything all set in place, and it seems like it's irreversible, and that then you will be presented with the fait accompli. You're told, well, uh, we have to have world government because these problems that we face are global in nature. We need global solutions. The only way to do it is through world government. And besides, we have all of this already in place. So uh, don't fight it. So they are pushing migration and an end to borders all across the world, and it's coming from the United Nations, it's coming through uh, our media, our fake news media, it's coming from organizations like the Council on Foreign Relations, and they're perverting our language. So we need to understand some very important things because these things have changed subtly. We need to understand that migration is not immigration. 
and when politicians and news media uh, people use those terms, we need to call them on it when they are interchanging these terms and using that to, in, uh, to psychologically manipulate us. Migration is not immigration, and migrants are not immigrants. What's the difference? Well, every country in the world, you can't, you can't uh, give me anyone that doesn't have a, an immigration law or immigration laws. All countries regulate who may enter into them, under what conditions, how many may come in, uh, and uh, what they have, what one has to do, what one has to perform in order to be accepted. We have immigration laws, as does every other country, and that's just common sense. We all have doors on our homes. Even Nancy Pelosi does. Even Chuck Schumer. Uh, even Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, we don't allow just anybody to walk in our front door or our back door or come through our windows. One has to ask permission. Otherwise, one is committing an illegal act. It's the same with our common home, our nation. We have national laws that determine who may come in, how many may come in, under what conditions, when they may come in, what they have to do perform after they come in, the inspections they have to go through for medical uh, procedures to check to make sure they don't have communicable diseases. So all of those things are very important. So people who abide by those laws and come in according to our determination are immigrants. Mm -hmm. Those who jump the border, who come in illegally, are migrants. There's a big difference. And uh, we are seeing the media and the United Nations and those who are promoting it trying to confuse the issues by using those interchangeably. And as you'll see, they are trying to make migration a right. In other words, anyone, because they determine they have need, uh, can come across our border, and we sh should have nothing to say about it, they say. But migration is not a right. And in fact, immigration is not a right. No one has a right to uh, immigrate into our country. It, we have a right to determine who may do that. Opposing migration does not make one anti-immigrant. But that is a term that you see all the time whenever anybody refers to uh, the President Trump or uh, any of his restrictions or any of the proposals by members of Congress or by members of the public, fellow citizens who say we have to have more controls on our border. They'll say you're anti-immigrant. Why is that? because they've been saying for, and have been drilling into our minds for decades, that we are a nation of immigrants. And that is true. But then they try to confuse the issue by saying, if you are against open migration, that you're anti-immigrant. Supporting reasonable immigration restrictions does not make one anti-immigrant. Supporting reasonable immigration restrictions does not make one racist or xenophobic. We know that to be the case, but we know that the media and those whom they are promoting constantly do that. They claim that if you want reasonable restrictions, that you're somehow racist, xenophobic, uh, anti-immigrant. Now, uh, many of you will recognize this individual here. That's Alex Newman, my colleague. He is a uh, one of our uh, Correspondence. He's on a nationwide tour now on uh, education, uh, rescuing our children. Uh, he's a, a wonderful writer for us, and uh, in this particular video, he is interviewing uh, this woman, uh, Alonso uh, Hansberg, who is Nicaraguan. She immigrated legally into this country, and she is the head of an organization called Legal Immigrants for America. 
And uh, so if you go online to The New American, very good uh, interview that she gives here, uh, explaining that uh, people from all over the world who she represents in, in her organization have come here legally and support efforts to keep our borders safe and secure and uh, to restrict migration and to make sure that people uh, immigrate here legally. Exercising judicious control over one's borders is an essential feature of sovereignty. Exercising judicial control over one's borders is essential to national survival. Failure to control one's borders is a guarantee of national suicide. Open borders progressives and the globalists who support them really intend to suicide us. They intend to destroy this country. And we'll, we'll show uh, the evidence for that. But it's also important for us to, to realize that many of the conservatives and people who are upset about our open borders are missing the point if they think that just building a wall is going to solve the problem. Uh, in, in many areas, uh, particularly on our southern border, we definitely need a wall or some kind of barrier there. But border walls will ultimately fail if we give up our sovereignty. And this is very important right now. On our back table, we have literature. We'll go, we're, we're just going to be able to mention it briefly here. But President Trump, who has made the border and the border wall one of his signature policy and we're glad that he has uh, focused on that uh, he is promoting now the United States Mexico Canada trade pact the USMCA and it like NAFTA which it, which it is uh, intended to replace and which candidate Trump rightfully denounced and attacked and opposed uh, the USMCA would even be worse than NAFTA. Are you aware of that? Have you looked at the USMCA? Well, it is more than 1,700 pages thick. So very few people, in fact, I don't, I think one of the problems is President Trump hasn't actually read through it yet. And in fact, as we have pointed out in our uh, literature on the USMCA, a big part of the problem with it is that it was negotiated mostly by Obama administration appointees and then President Trump brought on Robert Lighthizer to be his point man on the USMCA and unfortunately Robert Lighthizer is a longtime globalist, he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and he put his stamp on it and so we have Lighthizer for the CFR and all these Trump, uh, Obama administration appointees that negotiated this. And for whatever reason, President Trump has said it's wonderful and he's jumped behind it. Uh, if that goes through, if Congress approves of it, we will find ourselves in the same situation that the people of Europe have found themselves in and that now in Britain, the people of Britain, of course, in 2016, voted for Brexit to get out of the European Union, and they haven't been able to get out of it yet, right? And so it's been two years, and they voted to get out of it, and they're still stuck inside of it. And so they're still being forced to accept Brussels' control, European Union's control, over so much of their country. And that's what would happen under the USMCA. Uh, we have done, this is a <coughs> depiction there of the USMCA and uh, all of the side agreements and everything that go into it. Uh, we have this uh, information on the back table, this particular reprint and others and videos on it. Uh, that could come up for a vote in the next couple of months. So very important for us to be aware of that. Uh, we warned against NAFTA back during the Clinton administration when this was being promoted. And we had both 
Republicans and Democrats who jumped on behind it. All these conservative Republicans were uh, galled into supporting it by claims that it was going to be for free trade and it was going to help our economy. And even most of the very influential radio talk show hosts uh, got behind it and other conservative organizations. Uh, but it turned out to be a disaster and uh, the USMCA would be as well. It would give regional authorities and ultimately the World Trade Organization and United Nations authorities uh, control over legislative, executive, and judicial powers, uh, gradually empowering them just as the European Union's uh, trade pacts have done. Again, we're seeing how this, particularly in the USMCA, is pro providing pressure from above while all of the uh, pressure on our border from all of the uh, radical groups is providing pressure from below. Pueblo Sin Fronteras, I mentioned earlier, this is the group that is pushing uh, for uh, bringing all of these caravans up there, but who are they actually? Uh, they're organized out of Chicago uh, the primary organizations are La Familia Latina Unida, the United Latin Family of Chicago. This is a Saul Alinsky group. If you're familiar with Saul Alinsky, he got started in Chicago in the 1960s, Rules for Radicals, Reveille for Radicals. He's a Marxist organizer. ACORN and other organizations like that are part of his creation. He created this huge network of radical uh, uh, progressive groups. Uh, Centro Sin Fronteras is another one, again a Chicago Alinsky group. The National Lawyers Guild is a, uh, cited by uh, uh, congressional committees as, a, as an official communist front. The ACLU, the Ford Foundation, of course the Rockefeller Foundation as well, and the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. These are just some of the major uh, groups that are supporting Pueblo Sin Fronteras. As those caravans have come through Mexico, uh, you, different United Nations organizations have helped support them all the way. And so this is part of the UN's whole migration uh, program. Now this has created a genuine crisis on our border. We have been reporting almost every day on different things going on on our border. This is from the New American online. Uh, the, Customs and Border Protection. Border in crisis. Situation is unsustainable. Border is virtually wide open. In 90 days, DHS looses 100,000 illegals on, upon unsuspecting Americans. Border Patrol. Caravan-like numbers hitting border every week. Last week, 1,766 caught in one day. These are all just stories in the last month and a half. Illegal alien invasion crisis, not just at the border. Uh, you know, most, most of the stuff is focused on the big caravans coming across the border. We've been reporting for years that in addition to that, we have hundreds of thousands of illegals who come here as students, as tourists, as business visas, as temporary workers who come here on various visas and then just never leave. They overstay their visas and we haven't been following up on that. Overwhelmed by illegal migrant drop-offs, Las Cruces, New Mexico appeals for donations. Catch and release floods Yuma, Arizona with migrants. Mayor declares emergency. How about this one? And did any of you uh, read or hear about this? Mexican soldiers stop and disarm U.S. troops on the U.S. side of the border. Uh, this was just uh, recently uh, when we had our troops uh, down there. The Mexican troops came across onto our side and disarmed American soldiers. Uh, we've had many other cases over the years that we reported on where Mexican police and Mexican soldiers who were involved in the drug trade actually came on our side, actually fired their weapons on our side. Caught at the border, a murderer deported three times, another three-timer, a girl with measles. But what if 42 million migrants 
appeared at our border. Now this isn't one of our headlines, this came from the Gallup poll. You've all heard of the Gallup poll. The Gallup poll isn't an affiliate of the John Birch Society. It's a liberal left establishment uh, survey poll. This is uh, a poll that they took recently. And they said, what if there were 42 million migrants at our border? The, the actual quote from them, they said, open borders, quote, open borders could potentially attract 42 million Latin Americans, a full 5 million who are planning to move in the next 12 months say they are moving to the U.S. Now, that should have been headlines all across the country, uh, but it wasn't. We reported on it. Gallup, 5 million illegals head for the U.S. within the year. 42 million want to come. So, Europe's migration crisis was a wake-up call. It should have been a huge wake-up call to us. Uh, I don't know if any of you travel in Europe, uh, but it is very sobering and frightening to go there now. Uh, it has completely changed uh, the face of Europe. Uh, we are seeing uh, all across uh, Europe uh, examples of how uh, serious this has been economically, socially, politically, uh, crime-wise, uh, terrorism, uh, all of the, the, the ill effects of it. We did a special on that called Refugees Using Chaos to Build Power. And that's exactly what the United Nations and the Socialist International and those who were promoting this have been doing. They create, they want to transform Europe and all, essentially all of Christendom, remain, what remains of Christendom, of modern uh, American and European society, uh, transform it. And to do that you first must create chaos and disaggregate the current country, the current order, so it can be remade. And that's a, that is what they are doing. The refugee crisis, using chaos to build power. Again, Antonio Gutierrez, he was the one, the, one of the main architects behind it. Now he's running the United Nations. During the Obama administration, this was put out by uh, uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement at the Department of Health and Human Services by the Obama administration. They showed the whole U.S. and where they planned to bring thousands of refugees. Many of them were actually resettled in these places. They planned to bring tens of thousands more, but it was only because of the European situation and Americans becoming alarmed enough that the Obama administration received pushback from Congress because too many people were contacting their congressmen and the Obama administration wasn't able to uh, finish its plans for uh, bringing all these refugees here. We wrote about it in this article in the New American, both in our print and in our online edition, is Obama's refugee surge coming to your hometown. And we showed all the different areas they were uh, planning to bring them to, and the different organizations they were funding, including church organizations and NGOs, uh, nonprofits that were being uh, brought in to help uh, bring this about. These are some of the photos of the caravans coming here to the United States in Mexico. Now, recently there was an election in Mexico in which this man, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, also known as AMLO, was elected as president of Mexico. And much of the uh, chattering class analysts at the, in the media said, Oh, this is going to be a good thing for Mexico because uh, he'll bring more stability to Mexico, he's more popular, and uh, people in Mexico then won't be uh, uh, driven to come across our borders. Well, we knew that wasn't going to be the case, and in fact, it hasn't been the case. Here's a, uh, just one headline from Bloomberg News Service. Mexico's bloodshed surges in first months of AMLO present presidency. Murders climb. 10% from January through March. 
massacre in Veracruz over weekend, renewed focus on violence. In fact, the violence has increased there, and that presages even more people fleeing uh, to the United States. Now, a very important issue is that we really don't know how many illegal aliens, how many migrants are already here. Uh, this is a uh, journal, PLOS One, it's a well-respected establishment, liberal left, peer-reviewed science journal, the uh, Public Library of Science, and uh, this particular uh, article is titled, The Number of Undocumented Immigrants in the United States, Estimates Based on Demographic Modeling with Data from 1990 to 2016. What did they find? They found that all of the most commonly cited numbers of 11 million, 11.3 million, uh, that the administrations and that the media have been citing were woefully undercounted. In fact, they said, quote, our conservative estimate is 16.7 million illegals by 2016, nearly 50% higher than the most prominent current estimate of 11.3 million, which is based on survey data, etc. The mean estimate based on our simulation analysis is 22.1 million, essentially double the current widely accepted estimate. Uh, now this is the most comprehensive uh, uh, tabulation that has been done thus far. So whether it's 11.3 million, which they've been citing for, for, for years, or whether it is 22 million, uh, obviously either one of those is bad, but as you get up uh, into the higher numbers, the seriousness uh, increases. So we definitely are in a uh, crisis mode. They're already destroying our borders. And the compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration is an important part of that. Uh, it calls for, in Objective 23, to strengthen international cooperation and global partnerships for orderly and regular migration. Migration, migration. They're not talking about immigration anymore. They're pushing this whole idea of migration, that everyone has a right to migrate. Ergo, we have no right to stop them from migrating. Thus, we have no right to stop them coming across our borders. We also commit to promote the mutually reinforcing nature between the Global Compact and existing international legal and policy frameworks by aligning the implementation of this global compact with such frameworks, particularly the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. If you're not familiar with that, uh, the Agenda 21 for a Sustainable Development, we've been writing about that for decades. I was about the only uh, non-fake news media journalist at the original Earth Summit in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, the New American was the first one to report on Agenda 21. If you're not familiar with that, that is the big UN agenda program for completely using the environment to completely uh, remake the whole global political and economic landscape. That has now been uh, graduated to Agenda 2030. Now here they cite, right in here, the Agenda 2030. Uh, as part of this global compact on migration. Now, um, again, when I say pressure from above and pressure from below, when we look at the United Nations, the UN itself didn't actually come up with all of this migration stuff. Where did it come from? Well, this is one of the places that was the central uh, brainstem for it, the Migration Policy Institute. You might not be familiar with it. It's not something most Americans have heard of. We've written about it a lot in the, in the New American Magazine. Migration Policy Institute, or MPI, was formed by this woman, Doris Meissner. 
Now, we've been writing about her for many years. Who is she? Who is Doris Meissner? Well, you might remember during the Clinton administration, she was the commissioner on immigration. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She was a, uh, a big wig, a, a fellow, a, uh, one of the brains, in the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And it was the Carnegie Endowment uh, sponsoring her that started this organization. The Carnegie Endowment is one of those Council on Foreign Relations adjuncts. Can anybody think of who is one of the most infamous presidents of the Carnegie Endowment uh, who uh, helped uh, bring this about? Does the name Alger Hiss ring a bell? Alger Hiss, the Soviet spy, the Soviet agent, Stalin's agent, in the Roosevelt administration. Mm -hmm. Alger Hiss was the first Secretary General of the United Nations at its founding, acting uh, Secretary General at its founding conference in San Francisco. He was an advisor to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt while he was working as a Soviet agent. He formed, helped uh, use uh, the Carnegie Endowment she is a, a, a member uh, of it. He was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. The Carnegie Endowment is pushing this. Uh, the MPI was funded uh, by the Carnegie Endowment, by the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations, the European Commission, which is helping destroy Europe's borders, the Ford Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Government of Canada, the Government of Mexico, the Open Society Foundations, that's George Soros, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And of course, George Soros. Now, again, we get back to George Soros. One of his big buddies on Wall Street was Robert Bartley of the Wall Street Journal. People think the Wall Street Journal, that's a very conservative news organization. It is a globalist organization. It sometimes takes a so-called conservative position on this or that economic or political issue, but it always pushes the globalist agenda in those important issues that really affect our national sovereignty. And again, Robert Bartley said, the nation state is finished. There shall be open borders. This is where it's important, ladies and gentlemen, for us to realize this is not just a partisan issue. Uh, too many conservatives and too many of our friends in the talk show radio environment tell us that we just have to vote Republican every four years and everything will be fine. Well, too many Republicans, like Robert Bartley, are selling this out and have been for many years. Who is this man? Most Americans have not heard of him very important man. He dictates a lot of the policy around the world. How? By his opinions in the Financial Times. The Financial Times, published in London, sometimes called the London Financial Times, it is one of the most influential publications in the world. Gideon Rockman is a globalist who attends the Bilderberg meetings and the European uh, Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, he wrote an essay here called, and now for world government. Uh, in that uh, essay in the Financial Times, he says, so it seems everything is in place. For the first time since Homo sapiens began to doodle on cave walls, there is an argument, an opportunity, and a means to make serious steps towards a world government. But the third point, a change in the political atmosphere suggests that global governance could come about through a financial crisis, through climate change, or as he points out later in the essay, other global crises. Well, the global migration crisis, which is being caused by many of these globalists, is now being used as a reason for us to become global citizens. This is the Financial Times. It says, be a global citizen, become an FT, Financial Times, subscriber. These globalists do not consider, these 
they may be some, many of the most important ones are American citizens, or British citizens, or French citizens, or German citizens, but they do not count themselves as being national right. citizens. They call themselves global citizens. Right. That's why we see here uh, Strobe Talbot uh, in his essay, which I mentioned earlier, The Birth of the Global Nation. Uh, this is a, an essay which uh, is being promoted all across uh, in our colleges and our universities and has been for a couple of decades. And so I want to take just a couple of minutes here to focus on this one individual which most Americans are, are not really that conversant in because he represents several hundred of these global citizens and the influence that they wield. So who is Strobe Talbot, who said, nationhood as we know it will be obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority. Uh, <clears throat> he said that in his Time essay, July 20, 1992, during the uh, Clinton administration. So who was he? He was Bill Clinton's pal, his roommate, his ambassador at large. They had been roommates uh, while Rhodes Scholars together at Oxford. He was Hillary Clinton's advisor, George Soros's advisor, president of the Brookings Institution. Brookings Institution, next to the Council on Foreign Relations, is probably the second most important think tank in the United States. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, member of the World Federalist Association, and he is not the only one of this elite uh, fraternity who are also uh, uh, not just a, a leader uh, for one world, like the Los Angeles Times says here, but a Soviet agent. Stroke Talbot, Mr. Elite, uh, walks with the, uh, t the elite of Wall Street and of Washington, D.C., was exposed in this book by Sergei Trechikov. Sergei Trechikov was a, a Soviet KGB defector. In this book, Comrade J, The World's Secrets, The Untold Secrets of Russia's Master Spy in America After the End of the Cold War. It's written by Pete Early along with Trechikov. Pete Early is a liberal Washington Post uh, reporter published this book on exposing, one of the major things they exposed was Strobe Talbot and his role as a disinformation agent for the Soviet KGB. Now we had already exposed that years before, pointing out that Strobe Talbot, while at Time Magazine, he was the translator of Khrushchev's memoirs, he was a KGB comrade of this man, Victor Luis a Soviet KGB agent, a so-called journalist who CBS, New York Times, Washington Post, and other major media uh, used, particularly during the Vietnam War and, and afterwards. Uh, but this is who we're dealing with. Strobe Talbot, who calls for the end of the nation state, is simply echoing what all the communists have been calling for for, for decades and, and longer. And this is the Brookings Institution. I think it's quite telling that they even say here, they're creating order from chaos, foreign policy in a troubled world. Well, yes, when you create the chaos, then you bring about your own order. They call it a new world order. Uh, and they're using the refugees and the migrants as a way of, of bringing that about. Um, I'm going to have to race through a few of these here. Again, uh, the, the whole story of this and the design of this is told in this very important book, The Shadows of Power, uh, by James Perloff, and we do have copies in the back. Uh, this is one of the best uh, sources for getting a good grasp on all this, showing through one administration after another, both Republican and Democrat, uh, how the top administrations have been staffed with Council on Foreign Relations members and um, interestingly, uh, it just came out uh, uh, in WikiLeaks uh, two years ago 
that when President Obama was elected, uh, he got a, uh, John Podesta, uh, got a, an email from Michael Froman. Michael Froman was at Citibank. He was a Council on Foreign Relations member. He sent him a whole list of people for Obama to put in his administration. And guess what? Everybody that was on Michael Froman, on the CFO, Council on Foreign Relations list, Obama put into his administration, and all of his cabinet. Uh, we didn't have access to that memo at that time. It wasn't until it came out in WikiLeaks uh, that that was finally revealed. But we could see that that is what was happening. We could see that he was appointing all of these globalists uh, into his administration. And uh, now it comes out later that, of course, uh, it was all hand-delivered to him. And uh, he simply uh, put all of these people uh, into his administration. That's what has been happening uh, during the Bush administration. That's what happened in the Clinton administration. Now, Antonio Gutierrez, who did the uh, put, push through the migration policy debacle in, in Europe, here we see him here at the Council on Foreign Relations. This is the Council on Foreign Relations website. He is there promoting the CFR, they are promoting him, and they're both promoting migration as a way to break down our borders. Now, just last week, I wrote an article for the New American Magazine about the Council of Councils. Uh, yes, last week in Washington, D.C., the Council on Foreign Relations held a very important meeting that was publicly, the, uh, uh, mentioned on their own website called the Council of Councils. That is an organization they started six years ago with all of their affiliates that they've helped start in 25 countries, 29 different organizations in 25 countries, including Communist China, including Russia, uh, and including all of the European countries, uh, in which they bring all of these leaders together so that they can coordinate these activities at the United Nations, at the G7 summit, at the G20 summit, and at these other venues. This particular one from the Council on Foreign Relations and the Council of Councils is called Domesticating the Giant, the Global Governance of Migration. And they're pushing that UN migration conference. And so they show this photo of the G20 summit and they mention in there, the council has all of these Sherpas, these are the guides who are going to lead all of the elected leaders of the world into implementing these programs at these summits. So this is the Council of Councils uh, organization started by the CFR, and here this year they're really using all of these earth programs, environmental programs, to push for globalism and global government. The Global Summits of 2019, that's why they're really promoting right now all of the global warming, uh, the global uh, extinction, all of those uh, UN environmental programs. This is the Council of Councils. This is a list of all of their different organizations. So. If you go to their website, which on, on our article uh, at the New American, oops, uh, we give links to each of these uh, Council of Councils and CFR web pages. You can see all the different organizations. You can see how they are able to at, these, at the United Nations, at the G7, at the G20, how they're able to coordinate all of these activities so that all of the countries end up uh, supporting uh, this agenda. And of course, it is essential for them that all of the media uh, provide the same, uh, the same propaganda. Uh, this is a chart put out by the Swiss Propaganda Research Group, SPR. They put out a number of uh, very good charts 
uh, showing the connections, in this particular one of the Council on Foreign Relations. This is another group, the Bilderberg Meeting. Some of you have heard about them. The Trilateral Commission, that's another powerful group. All of these are affiliated with each other. Uh, and it shows all of the different media personalities and all of the different corporate media here and how they are all interconnected. And that is why you get all of the same propaganda from the same fake news uh, organs. The next slide gives a close-up of some of them. The actual links, which I've put in our article on this online, uh, take you to all of the individual uh, people involved there, so you can see their, their backgrounds. So you have Time, The Economist, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, A ABC, CBS, all regurgitating the same uh, propaganda. Now, uh, during his State of the Union address, President uh, Trump said, uh, New York Times is taking him to task, fact check, President Trump's State of the Union address. President Trump described illegal border crossings as an urgent national crisis. The New York Times then tweets, this is false. Illegal border crossings have been declining for two decades. And they go on to uh, claim that they are discrediting the president's uh, assertion. Of course, the New York Times was wrong, terribly wrong. Uh, president Trump was correct as Subsequent to this, the New York Times had to come out in March when all the figures came out and showed that the president was right. The New York Times admitted, yes, there is a crisis. Uh, and that is why uh, President Trump's famous tweet heard around the world about fake news is so important. He said in February of 2017, the fake news media, the failing New York Times, NBC News, ABC, CBS, CNN, is not my enemy, it is the enemy of the American people, end quote. Now, you know what happened. What did they say? Oh, President Trump is attacking uh, freedom of the press. President Trump is attacking the Constitution. President Trump is trying to undermine people's ability to have access to the media. No, he wasn't saying that at all. And anyone who, uh, who really follows uh, what he was saying knows that that wasn't true. He was asked about that by Fox News host Ainsley Earhart. She said, is the press the enemy of the people? President Trump said, no, not at all. But the fake news is. And the fake news is comprised of it's a lot. It's a big chunk, okay? Somebody said, what's the chunk? I said, 80%. It's a lot. It's a lot. That's, that's the way he talks. <laughs> that's what, but, it, but it's true. Uh, we know that. We've known that for a long time. I go to, have, have been for over 40 years now. I'm a, a accredited uh, journalist at the United Nations. I've been our, our correspondent at the United Nations for over three decades. I've been to many of these world summits. I sit there in the press corps with the New York Times, with the Chicago Sun Tribune, with all of the uh, various broadcast and print media, and I see the lies that they print, and I'm right there. I see that uh, that isn't what's happening here. When Fidel Castro came into the Earth Summit, in Rio de Janeiro, all of the delegates arose, Viva Fidel, it was an uproar of applause for Fidel. All of the press corps did the same thing. They're all Fidelistas, Castroites. Uh, and that happened when Gorbachev came to the summit. It happens any time one of these dictators come there. These, the, the press, the, the fake news media, are indeed the enemies of the American people. They're not going to tell you, uh, I'm going to wind this up uh, right now, but uh, what they're really uh, planning, our enemies, are is to replace you, replace us with different voters. And it goes back to this strategy, the Cl Cloward Piven strategy. Now, uh, the fake news media isn't going to tell you about it, but this is Andrew Cloward. Oops. 
and Francis Fox Piven, professors at that time in the 1960s at Columbia University. They wrote an essay entitled The Weight of the Poor. It appeared in The Nation magazine, one of the oldest uh, socialist uh, magazines here in the United States. And the, the process of it is this, that we want to establish a socialist regime here in the United States. The best way to do it is to cause our economy to collapse. And the best way to cause the economy to collapse is to get as many people as possible on the welfare rolls and as many people as possible on the welfare wagon uh, so that there's more people on the wagon than there are people pulling it. The economy will collapse and then we can have a socialist, a new socialist regime. And that's what uh, the so-called progressives have been pursuing for 50, for 50 years. Get as many people to be takers instead of givers. Uh, takers instead of producers. And so they have been doing that and uh, it has had a, a huge uh, deleterious effect on our economy. However, the American economy has still been too resilient. They haven't been able to collapse us yet. And in the past couple of years, what has been happening? The Trump administration has brought unemployment down. Uh, we've had a huge millions of new jobs created. And a lot of people have said, hey, I can do better working than being on welfare. And a lot of people have been going to work. Dang, that kind of messes things up for the uh, Cloward Piven strategy. And not only that, they found that lots of people all across the political spectrum are against getting rid of ICE, against getting rid of our borders, they are against uh, more migration. In fact, the Harvard-Harris poll, again, last time I checked, Harvard-Harris poll was not a John Burt Society affiliate. Uh, it, they found, uh, this was just less than a year ago, that among swing voters, 73% are opposed to abolishing ICE. Among independents, 73%. Democrats, 59%. Republicans, 78%. Blacks, 63%. Hispanics, 50%. Men, 68%. Women, 70%. Hillary Clinton voters, 59%. Dang, that's kind of messing up the whole plan. That's not working so well. Then when they get to asking if people want stricter immigration controls, again, 70% of most voters uh, uh, want stricter uh, uh, immigration controls. 69% of independents, 51% of Democrats, 92% of Republicans, 53% of blacks, 51% of Hispanics, 72% of men, 68% of women. Nancy Pelosi and uh, uh, John Lewis and other members of the uh, Democrat establishment Go, wow, this is not working very well. We better import some new voters. And that's what they've been doing. They want to replace you, replace your fellow Americans who are not going along with the program with people who will go along. And so they are trying to bring in more and more migrants. They're trying to do away with the borders so that they can simply flood this country and completely take it over uh, from within. And all of this, uh, as we've been explaining for many years, it uh, was outlined over 60 years, 70 years ago, in this important study by Jan Kozak. He was the communist strategist uh, for the Czechoslovakian Communist Party, and he put together this program called How Parliament Can Play a Revolutionary Part in the transition to socialism, and by that he meant communism, because he was a leader of the Communist Party. The title of it was, And Not a Shot is Fired. In other words, how you can peacefully take over the country without a violent revolution by using pressure from above and pressure from below. He actually uh, uh, used the, those terms. That's how we, we go about We have the people in the streets who are demonstrating. You have the legislators who say we're responding to the will of the people. We have the media who go along to, to promote it. Uh, and you have the organized uh, funders who help fund the AstroTurf uh, rent mobs at the bottom. Uh, so, 
That is what they are doing now. They intend to use revolutionary parliamentarianism using legislation. That is what the Pelosi's and the uh, Schumer's and the uh, Kamala Harris's and Ocasio-Cortez's are doing. They, they are trying to uh, vote us into uh, slavery, into socialism. What are we going to do to change that? Well, what have you been doing thus far? Each of us has to look at ourselves, look in the mirror and see, what have I, what have I done today? What did I do yesterday? What am I going to do tomorrow? They intend to take this country away from us. We are in a war. Unfortunately, most Americans are oblivious to it. They don't realize we're in a war. Uh, and we're losing by default because we're not appearing on the battlefield. We've abandoned the battlefield to the enemy. And we have to get on that battlefield. And guess what? Just listening to talk radio isn't being on the battlefield. Just going on YouTube and watching all the videos is not appearing on the battlefield. We have to get on the battlefield. Uh, and that means uh, we have to get active. Uh, the John Birch Society is an action-oriented uh, uh, organization. We have actual uh, battlefield programs. Just one of them, besides uh, the New American, uh, we publish uh, the New American, we publish books, we publish videos, we put out speakers, uh, we send our uh, correspondence to all these UN uh, international summits. Most of the other conservative organizations ignore the UN except for on occasions when uh, there might be a vote uh, about it in Congress. Uh, but if we aren't keeping up with what they're doing and uh, informing the American people about it, uh, they're not even going to be aware of most of these things until after they've taken place. Uh, the New American keeps uh, the American people informed about these things. The John Birch Society does that. We have uh, in the New American our Freedom Index. Our Freedom Index, uh, when you go there and you click on the Voting Index, it brings up your congressman. Uh, you can uh, see how he votes, he or she votes, on all of the important uh, issues, how they are rating on, uh, on those constitutional issues. Uh, we give a uh, summary of each of the important bills, uh, give links to where you can actually go to them on the con in the congressional record if you want to read the entire bill. Most Americans don't have the time or inclination to do that. We do it for you. Uh, and then we show you whether your congressman is voting for it or against it. Simply listening to your congressman when, he get, when he's on the local news or going to his town meeting isn't enough. Because, guess what? Politicians don't always tell the truth. <laughs> I'm sorry to disillusion you, but that is the case. Uh, how do you know if they're telling the truth? You go to the voting record. Uh, it's how they vote. Uh, not their rhetoric. It's the, the vote that counts. Uh, so this is just one of the, the many ways that we do that. We keep uh, people informed uh, to let, let them know that this is not just a partisan battle. Uh, it's not enough to be registered as a Republican and vote every couple of years or every four years. Uh, one of the reasons why we're in the predicament we are is that Democrats and Republicans, even though they go through these wrestling matches uh, on, on television, all the drama, when it comes to the important issues, they're oftentimes voting uh, to destroy us uh, together, Democrats and Republicans. That is why we've had a succession of Republican leaders who have repeatedly betrayed their oath of office, their promises to the American people, betrayed the Republican Party's uh, platform, and most Americans don't realize that because most of the time they're still using the same rhetoric, they're saying the things that we want to hear, uh, but most Americans aren't actually checking their record. 
Uh, so we need to do that. We need to hold the politicians accountable. And we need to realize that even with President Trump, uh, we have a number of uh, issues of the New American Magazine back there, including one uh, with him on the cover about the latest, uh, the Mueller uh, report, showing that, uh, as we've been saying for the last couple of years, all of the charges of collusion uh, that have been leveled against him are completely false, that that was all a, a, a huge uh, coup attempt. Uh, that was really collusion by America's enemies to unseat the legally, constitutionally elected President of the United States. Even though we have supported him on that, President Trump uh, still misses the mark on some very important issues. And the John Birch Society, everyone recognizes who's followed us, re realizes that we do not stand behind any particular politician. We are not a political organization. We hold everybody accountable to the Constitution. And when he is doing what is right, we support him. When he is doing what is wrong, we do not support him. And President Trump, uh, as we said, with the USMCA, is way off base, dangerously off base. He has been off base on a number of things. And uh, I think that's a very important distinction for people to make. We don't just blindly support any political figure. Uh, we have to look at them and hold them accountable because they're under tremendous pressure. And if we don't hold them accountable, uh, nobody else will. So we are in right now heading into a critical phase of the uh, next couple of years and uh, your local committees, your local chapters of the John Bird Society are busy building a base here to make sure that what you do here will be amplified all across the country because we have chapters in every community ac across the country. And we're going to make sure that we hold fast to the Constitution. Uh, we have back here uh, Kip Webster. Kip, will you hold up your hand? Uh, he is the coordinator for this area. Uh, Wayne Morrow in the very back is the national director of field activities. And how many chapter leaders do we have in here? Tom, right there, and uh, in the very back. Okay, so we have. Uh, all of these folks in the very back here uh, are officials, uh, either uh, staff members or uh, volunteer leaders of the John Birch Society. And they're here to help you uh, to keep informed, to let you know about all the new activities that we have coming up uh, to uh, help you be more effective in all of your activities. So the John Birch Society is going to uh, continue uh, our educational activities and uh, we invite all of you to keep uh, informed and to join with us in this effort uh, because uh, if we don't uh, we will have no borders and no nation. So I thank you very much and I will be willing to take questions uh, here for a while. I know some of you have to go uh, but we can uh, stick around here and answer any questions you might yeah, have. How about we take questions? Because Bill will be here. So, you know, after we close with a few things, you can take your time, food, drink, enjoy yourself. Want to mention Glenn Fontaine, of course. Bill just mentioned from mm -hmm. Norwich. Thank you for driving up, Glenn. And while uh, the staff is driven from all over the country to get here, to three staff members.